All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Chasing Gazillions. Not the same as making millions. I'm your host, Anthony Bowling, with Keller Williams and the Anthony Bowling Group. And I got an exciting coaching call for you today. I am so excited. I'm here today doing a coaching call with a young man uh, who uh, is almost a mirror image. I know you're looking at him right now. And you're just like, a mirror image? Dude, this is, you are old, broke down dude. <laughs> Some old man. This dude over here is a handsome, virile, young, 20-year-old. You got a broken mirror. No, no. What I'm saying <laughs> is uh, Sam Bond is uh, who he will come in and introduce himself at a moment. Sam is a rising junior at the University of Virginia, my alma mater. Sam is uh, a defensive lineman like I was when I played at the University of Virginia. I played nose guard, hand in the dirt, hand in the dirt. And, but more importantly, Sam, just like me in the summer of my junior year, when I was struggling with what I was going to do with the rest of my life, if I graduated from school, uh, had an interest in real estate. And when I was a junior at the UVA, uh, in my junior year, I also caught the real estate bug and decided I wanted to be a real estate professional. Well, 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 really, the truth is, is that I was up late at night studying trying to get through classes and even in the summer summer classes and i was like mr Wu, this infomercial was coming on at two o'clock in the morning and he was like dude i just got to this country and if you buy my book you can make gazillions like me and i was like oh yeah that, that sounds good that's yeah that's what i want to do so that's how i got my interest in real estate my junior year uh but today uh, we are, that's 35 years later. I'm still a real estate professional out here, uh, providing services to all of you all out there. And, uh, we're excited about it, but today we want to, you know, share some information with Sam. I'm not Mr. Wu. I'm not going to sell him a book, have him buy my book. <laughs> And then find out 30 years later, no, chasing gazillions ain't the same as making millions. No, what we're going to do instead is we're going to provide Sam with, and all of you all who are out here on the call today, uh, with some uh, information that I've gained, you know, in this business and my journey to give him a broader perspective of the real estate industry, a broader view so that as he is going forward, finishing up his degree at the University of Virginia, he'll have more information, more resources, and access to uh, other other people who can guide him. So with that, hey, Sam, come on. Tell everybody who you are, how you got here, where you're from, your journey uh, to, to this moment now. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. So my name is Sam Bond. I'm from North Jersey. I'm like closer to Pennsylvania than New York, but um, I came to UVA because I really value education and I'm interested in real estate because I know that there's no cap on how much money you can make. So like the more you put in, the more you get out, which is something I'm really interested in. That's great. That's great. And so you're a junior now, right? Yes, sir. All right. All right. Now, one thing I, you told me that was a little different from when back in the day we were playing ball at UVA is the summer voluntary mandatory practice schedule that you all are involved in now. Tell everybody when that starts and what that looks like right now today. Oh yeah. So um, we started the end of May and then we, we come back, we have two four week training blocks. So we go four weeks and we go home for a week and we come back for another four weeks. So we usually left at like around we, this morning was five 30 in the morning. It's usually around six in the morning now. So we get our work done before most people are even awake. Okay. All right. And, and what's the, uh, 
What what's the time? When are you all getting up to go to practice today? You you've already I know it's not military, and I know yeah. that little slogan that used to be we do more before 6 a.m. than most people do all day. But tell the people what your day has been like already. I mean, it's 10 o'clock. Yeah, you just got up. No, I've been up since about 4:45. 4:45. Yes, sir. Because you like just your early riser. No, <laughs> it's not a choice. <laughs> No, but I, I do I do enjoy getting up early, and it feels good to get a workout done and know that you made So you all had a workout already? Yes, sir. What time? Uh, it was 5.30. 5.30. Workout. Nice. Getting ready for the season. Were you excited about this season? What are you yeah. looking like this season? I think good. Good. You're saying I, I should keep my season tickets. I, I should keep coming down this year. I think There's you should be some front, exciting games this year. Front row tickets. Front row. Yes, sir. <laughs> Don't burn your UVA tickets this season. This is mm -hmm. going to be an exciting one. I love it. All right. Well, let's get started here, Sam. Let me bring this in. All right. Can you see the screen, Sam? Yes, sir. All right. So, chasing gazillions ain't the same as making millions. Presents... So you want to be a real estate professional? Well, okay, fine. Well, we're going to try to shift your focus today, Sam, towards a career in real estate. Now, here's some of the ground rules. Some of them don't apply because it's just you and I, Sam. We're going to take our time. But even still, uh, I've been in the business more than 30 years. And in this 30, 45-minute hour presentation, I can't give you 35 years of what I've done, seen, been through, in and out. Uh, you don't necessarily have to hold your questions. If you got questions as we go along, pop them out, because it's just you and I. Uh, primarily, though, you're going to find that I'm going to answer a lot of questions that you probably have. But the goal of the presentation is, again, to give you those next steps towards becoming a licensed real estate professional or not. A lot of people go through this coaching call and they get clarity about what they were thinking initially uh, is what a real estate professional does. And when they hear what I have to say, they either conclude, well, I don't want to do what Anthony Bowling's doing <laughs> or I, that's not what I want to do at all. Uh, just remember the numbers and all, this is from my practice. These are my opinions. Uh, these are not the opinions of, uh, Keller Williams, uh, my, my, uh, broker or any other organization that I might be affiliated with, of which I'm affiliated with a lot. This is just Anthony sharing information about what I've seen, what I've done. Uh, it's informational purposes only, uh, and always remember uh, it's not bragging is if it's true. <laughs> so here's the outline of today's discussion. Shifting your focus. It, number one, it's a business and it's about the money. Real estate professionals, we're going to talk about myths, categories, focus, consulting, education, follow up, follow through. Shift number one. Here's the big one, Sam, about getting into real estate and getting one's real estate license. It's a business. It's not a hobby. It's a business. Like any other business, whether you were thinking you were going to start a McDonald's franchise or Jiffy Lube franchise or Postal Connection shipping, it's a business. And with that, you have to right now focus on that there are a startup costs associated with getting into this business there are operating costs associated with this business beyond just your pre-licensing education requirements you have to take testing fees you have to pay to continuing education classes every two years to renew your license professional development constantly improving yourself traveling to conferences, multiple listing fees to have access to information, 
to join boards and associations. It's costs associated with running your business. Errors and emissions insurance. Hey, man, this is a big one. You you need errors and emissions insurance. You, I, I was recently involved in a lawsuit. I did everything right. I didn't do anything wrong. But when lawyers get involved, uh, which I am a lawyer, I'm not your lawyer. I'm your real estate coach today. But the point is, no, no, no shade to lawyers. What I'm saying is, is when they get involved, they they represent their clients. They sue everybody who was involved in near a, a transaction. And next thing you know, you're embroiled in a lawsuit. You need someone to represent you who is is not doing criminal law or your buddy who's a lawyer, but someone who understands what it is that you're up against. Errors and omissions insurance provides that protection to you and your business. There's broker calls. Hey, man, the broker. The broker's always got his hand in your pocket. He always, hey, nobody gets 100%, dude. You don't know you don't get 100 so, Always with the kick up. Always with the kick up, dude. Remember that. Uh, employment taxes, uh, marketing fees, internet costs. Vehicle expenses, gas. Okay. There are costs associated with running your business as a real estate agent. It's not just I sell a house, I make money, that's that. Now, I mentioned a broker. When you get your license and you go through the classes, you get your license, you become a licensed sales professional. But you have to affiliate, join, hook up with a broker. Only brokers are licensed in various jurisdictions to conduct sales, leasing of real estate. All the other people are agents underneath the broker. And all of these brokerages, you may know them as Long and Foster, Shannon and Lux, uh, Remax, uh, Exit. Uh, what's some of the brokerages you're familiar with up in New Jersey? Um, Wikers. Uh, Wiker. Bay. Yes, sir. Um, Caldwell Banker. Caldwell Banker. There you go. Mm -hmm. So those are brokers, brokerages, real estate brokerages that you, with your license, you join them. And then as an agent of that broker, you go out and conduct business. Well, all of these brokers that you join have associated fees for being in their shop. Now, I belong to the Keller Williams franchise operation. Uh, they're number one in a lot of categories around the country. I like them. Hey, Keller Williams, th this is not a push on Keller Williams. Well, it might be a push on Keller Williams. But the point is, <laughs> hey, I belong to Keller Williams. Uh, I mean, you got people that is involved in real estate, right? Don't you have somebody in involved in real estate? Yes, sir. My mom is involved in real estate. And, and what, what brokerage is she with? Keller Williams? She does work. No, Weikert. Weikert. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Hey. Like that's your mom. We're not gonna knock your mom about her decisions. She's been making good ones so far for you, Wiker. Okay, so but Wiker Keller Williams. Here are the fees associated with living. These are costs that are part of your business, and you haven't made any income. So there's consortium fees, there's technology fees, command. I was involved with commercial division at Keller Williams. Uh, KW Commercial, when you look at my name, you see designations behind my name like JD because I'm a lawyer, CCIM because I'm a certified commercial investment member. These are additional training uh, designations that a professional can earn that we use in our business. But to join KW Commercial, there's an additional cost, 125 And then COFTAR, you know, the MLS fees. But COFTAR is the commercial multiple listing service where all the properties are listed. When someone says, hey, I want to find a property. It's like, well, where do you go? Well, if you're in commercial real estate, primarily you go to CoStar. There are others. We go, But the point here is, here is about three, four, five, five $600 worth of fees every month that my business has to cover every month. Now, capping, different brokerages have different kinds of systems 
for how they get their monies from their agents. Keller Williams, we have a capping system. It's, it's sort of like an ante, sort of like if you, if you do any gambling, play cards, you have to put the ante up, right? If you do the poker thing, you know, you got the blinds and the big blinds, the small blinds, and you got the ante, the money that you put up front. At Keller Williams, the ante is called a cap. It, it, it puts a lid on top of how much you are going to pay to the broker from all of your proceeds this year. So this way up front, you know, day one, no matter how much income I make, I only have to pay to my broker $25,000. So I can make a hundred this year, 200, 300, right? Some brokerages, Sam, some, they get 50% of what you make. Doesn't matter how much you make. So if you make a hundred grand this year, they get 50%. If you make 300 grand this year, they make 50%. If you make 500 grand this year, they get 50%. Keller Williams says, no, you make as much as you want and you owe us 25. And, and you only pay the 25 as you go. So as you do transactions, you pay it. We're not good. That's a whole nother class about the capping system. For our purposes, what's important for you to know is these are operational costs associated with being in business with a brokerage. There's capping, there's cost of sales, there's admin fees. Every time you do a transaction, there's admin fees and there's coaching training, like what I'm doing now. I'm a coach. You know, if I'm coaching you and you're a new agent to the business and you're working with me and I'm guiding you and supporting you and telling you, advising you on how to make money in the business because you're brand new, then coaches earn a percentage of what you make as well. You see, everybody's in your pocket. Everybody's in your pocket, Sam. So here's an example of a typical transaction in real estate and what one might make and what one might keep. And the lesson for you here to learn is always focus on what you keep, not what you make. So let's say you brand new in a business today and with my help, you go out and you sell a house and you sell that house for $400,000. And the buyers are happy and the sellers are happy. And you earn a 3% commission for the sale of that house. That means in gross commission income, you would have earned $12,000. That's a nice commission on selling a $400,000 house. That's nice. Now, you say, I got 12 to spend. Nope, hold on. Of that $12,000, if you're in a Keller Williams system, you have to contribute 30% of that towards your company dollars. That's what CD is, towards your $22,000 cap. Uh oh, hold on. You know, Keller Williams is a national franchise, and, and it all of the little offices all around the country are independently owned and operated but there's a national guy gary keller and the national guys with the kick up remember we always got to kick up to the top guy so he gets a royalty fee of six percent and it's capped at three thousand now don't forget you're brand new in the business so you're working with me i'm guiding you it's not like this four hundred thousand transaction just fell off the boat i helped you get it so as your coach I earned 10%. And then there was an admin fee for keeping all this paperwork associated with the transaction. That's 225. So although even though you generated a commission of $12,000, you only keep $6,687. That's your net commission income in your pocket. And that's before our uncle gets involved. You know who our uncle is? Who's our uncle? The IRS. That's right. The government. That's right. So you always have to also pay income 
taxes on the income you generate. But that's between you and your tax accountant. That's another professional. That's for another discussion. But you're starting to get the picture here, Sam? Yes, sir. All right. So in the Keller Williams system, when do I make 100% of, of all the work I'm doing, Anthony? I got this cap of 25000 that I owe the house. They taking a piece of my money every time I do a transaction. When do I start making 100% of my efforts? And the answer is here. If you take that $25,000 and you divide it by an average commission of 3%, it generates a gross sales commission of about $833,000. And if you divide that by 36%, that means that you need to do 2,314,814 in gross sales volume. That's the total volume of sales you need to do in one year. Over $2 million in sales. A multi-million dollar sales producer you are, Sam. Now, how many sales does that turn out to be? Well, if your average sales price is 400000 that means you have to do Six sales this year, Sam. You have to close six sales with an average price of 400000 And then you cap. And now everything after the sixth sale, you get 100% of the commission. Less what you got to pay for operating expenses. But you, you don't have your broker in your pocket anymore. And that's a good thing. So how are we doing so far, Sam? How's any yeah. of this is any of this making any sense so far? Yes, sir. So how are you feeling so far about getting into real estate? Good. I just gotta make them six sales. Got to make, <laughs> well, we gotta make more than six sales. That just covers our cap, right? So we need to make more than six sales. But that's a, a very important point to, to recognize, Sam, that when you're starting your business. You need to know how many sales do I need to generate this year to make money? What's going to be my sales goal? So let's do shift number two, real estate agent or professional. So there are some basic fundamental differences between real estate professionals who focus their business primarily on residential versus commercial. Right. Uh, for me, Sam, I, I, I like to tell new people, hey, we all are real estate professionals. And do you know what the what makes someone a professional, Sam? Do you know what makes the lawyer, the doctor, the architect, the plumber? The plumber. Do you know what makes them all professionals? A piece of paper. Yeah, but what type of piece of paper makes them professionals? The license. The license, yeah. Yes, yes, Sam. It's the license that makes us all professionals. That's what distinguishes us from a hobby, having a hobby that we are licensed and regulated by some government authority. Real estate professionals are licensed. We're right up there with lawyers and plumbers and doctors and all, right? In fact, let me tell you this funny story about this other profession I met. And this is where I really got the message home about professionals. Uh, so I, I have... Uh, a drip at my home and uh i was trying to move that forward did i move that that didn't move forward let me move this forward 12 okay so i was telling you the story so uh i got a drip in my faucet in my kitchen at home and i call a plumber plumber comes over 
plumber, uh, he comes into the house. I say, yeah, my faucet's dripping. Can you, can you, he says, yeah, I can take care of this. I say, okay, great. And he walks by my, my, uh, lavatory, my half bath. And I go in, I use the lavatory for a moment. Right. And I step back out. When I step back out, he was leaving. I was like, well, where are you going, man? You, you, you can't fix the leak. He said, oh, it's already fixed. I said, it's fixed. He said, yeah, it's already fixed. I go in the kitchen. I say, well, it is fixed. I say, that was quick, man. That was fast. Wow, you weren't even in the house like two minutes. He's like, yeah, I took care of it. So he gives me his invoice. I said, okay, $150. $150. Dude, you, you weren't even in my house two minutes. $150. Look, I, I'm a lawyer. I'm just saying. I don't even make $150 an hour practicing law. And the plumber turns to me as he's leaving. He said, yeah. Well, when I was a lawyer practicing, I did wasn't making $150 an hour either. Bada boom. That's my best joke here, Sam. You got to roll with my jokes, man. You got to get the, that's my, that's, that's as good as it gets on jokes for me. See, but the point is, is that, yeah, professionals, they're licensed. They charge things. Uh, here's some myths. I see this is going to be a tough crowd here, man. This, this is going to be a long day here. I can see that young folk, man, young folk, man, you got to work hard, man. <laughs> I see that right now. Yeah, I work hard to get them to smile. Okay, fine. I'll put my A game on. I'm ready for you, Sam. I'm ready. Okay. So some myths about residential commercial real estate. Uh, a lot of one of the primary myths is that uh, you have to get special licensing to do commercial real estate. And that's just a myth, Sam. Once you are licensed as a real estate professional, the only thing that bars you from doing commercial real estate is the knowledge that you acquire and the people you associate with. That's it. That's all. It's what you know and who you know uh, that allows you to do commercial real estate. It's it, There's no special commercial license, at least not in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia jurisdictions. Now, maybe in New Jersey, maybe somewhere else, uh, you might, there might be, quote, a special commercial license that you have to obtain to do commercial real estate. But generally speaking, my experience, that's not the case. It's just a myth, right? Okay. All right. Now, this is what you've been waiting for, Sam. How do I make money? How do I make the big bucks? Well, generally speaking, Sam, there are six categories where the opportunity exists for you to make money. Here are your six basic categories, right? Helping people with their residential real estate needs. Office buildings, which is going to be primarily leasing, could be sales. Warehouse, industrial warehouse, which is a big, big uh, opportunity now with self-storage. Uh, retail restaurants, retail space. It's a lot of retail, a lot of restaurants out there looking for space. Fast food restaurants, barbershops, beauty salons, uh, multifamily, which is an area I specialize in, multifamily properties, five to 20 units uh, here in wards five, six, seven, and eight here in Washington, D.C. You see what I just did there, Sam? Did you hear that? that that's, that's what they call my elevator pitch. That's that quick, less than 20 second, bam, blurted out to somebody when they say, oh, you're a real estate agent? Say, yeah, what do you do? Bam. You got a, you got a little thing, a little stick. A little twenty second thing that, oh, oh, he he does multifamily properties. What size? Five to twenty units. Where? Oh, in wards five, six, seven, eight. Oh, where is that? In Washington D.C. Oh, okay, great. See, that's a little thing you learn. And then there's land, right? So let's look at some examples here of these six categories and what that looks like, and the opportunity it presents 
for you as a real estate professional to focus your business services towards the people who need your help in one of these six areas. That's what you're doing with your business, Sam, as a real estate professional. Your business help others buy, sell, and lease real estate in a specific category. And you are working to develop your skills and knowledge and expertise as a professional in one of these six categories so that consumers, investors, buyers, sellers, when they think about doing business in one of these six categories, hey, they think about you. So let's see. Residential. Here's a typical example, a transaction. As a licensed real estate professional, Sam, you could help somebody sell a residential luxury home. 1,800 square feet, four bedrooms, 3.5 baths. It's a row house in a particular neighborhood. And the gross sales volume, a million 175. Now, that's, a, that's really higher than that average $400,000 sales price, isn't it, Sam? Yes, sir. You're going to earn a little bit more than $12,000 in commission when you sell this house, aren't you? So this is how you begin to see, Sam, different markets offer different sales prices for residential properties. I'm here in the D.C. market, this particular neighborhood called Noma. They, we sell million-dollar homes here, right? Give me a question, Sam. Let me hear from you. You're good looking and all. You got a nice smile. Thank you. Let me hear what let me hear with your outside voice what's going on in your head. Um, do you think it's worth trying to work in a place where the homes are a higher cost, but then you might have to pay more in taxes, or do you think it's all um relative to each other? Like, do you know what I'm saying? I do. That's a great question. Thanks, Sam. Yes. So as a part of your business strategy, you will have to identify an area where it has certain property values. Now, that is going to be a business decision for you uh, on do I pick an area where the property values are higher? Now, here's what you have to decide in your business. It, the property values are higher. The competition for selling multifamily properties may be higher. Those sellers of those multifam of those million dollar properties may have requirements looking for a more established real estate professional to work on their million dollar properties. Your company may or may not have a reputation of selling million dollar properties compared with a neighborhood, say, of new homes where the average sales price might only be five hundred thousand dollars, but you can. Start your practice by farming there. I think the key is to develop a process by which you will regularly, systematically prospect in a targeted area to build your name recognition as a professional who works in this market. So it, it really comes down to if you pick a neighborhood, and you can, you can pick more than one. You can certainly have a high-end luxury neighborhood that you are farming where you're looking for an opportunity to serve those clients. You can have a middle-income neighborhood that you're farming and a lower one. You can target different people at different income brackets. Those are going to be decisions you're going to make with the guidance of uh, your mentors and your, your senior brokers and the market that you find yourself in, right? That comes from you studying the market that you're in to see. I mean, maybe in New Jersey, for example, 
maybe the average sales price of homes is $400,000. Maybe million dollars properties just is, is a rarity, right? We only got $10 million homes here, but there's a hundred, four hundred thousand dollar homes. Well, your business is probably going to focus on four hundred thousand dollar homes if you intend on making some money this year. Did that answer the question? Yes, sir. Thank you. You come on. I love that question. Let's see if we get another one. Now, here's another example where you could help an office building owner. This was a local nonprofit organization. You know, these nonprofit associations and businesses, they operate in buildings that they own. Sometimes they sell those buildings. In this case, this was a one-story building. It was 6,000 square feet, but it was on 9,000 square feet worth of land. We were able to sell the building to a developer who was able to build 22,000 square feet of building on that land versus the 6,000 square foot office that was there. And that made that, that site very valuable. And in this instance, the gross sales volume of that sale was almost $5 million. Again, not 400, but now we're dealing with commercial real estate. The value was almost 5 million. And so the commission would be different. But again, the service is the same. You see it, Sam? You're just helping someone who has a real estate need. And you, if you have the competence and confidence to help them, you can, with your sales associate license, help them sell their office building. Here's 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 one. This is a tenant representation assignment. Walgreens. Are, do you do you familiar with Walgreens? Yes, sir. Right. You you've gone into Walgreens, right? Mm -hmm. Walgreens lease space that they operate their business in. Someone helps them negotiate a lease, a long-term lease for the Walgreens to be there so that they can sell you Band-Aids with their business. As a licensed real estate professional, Sam, you could work with the corporate real estate people at Walgreens, help them find a location that they are looking for. In this case, they were looking for a location in a particular neighborhood here in D.C., Ward 8, 2,500 square feet. And we were able to help them negotiate a long-term 10-year lease, triple net. Again, don't worry about the triple nets. We'll get into that another day. But it was at a rate of $33 per square foot. For the 2,500 square feet, they paid $33 for every square foot, each one of those 2,500 square feet. And that generated a gross sales volume of $825,000. And again, the gross sales volume is what you are earning your commission on. So, but again, the focus here is for you to see, Sam, hey, I'm a licensed real estate professional. I could help someone buy a house. I could help someone sell an office building. Oh, now I can help a business lease space for them to operate in. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. That's giving you a wide variety of opportunity of services you can offer to the market. All right. Let me hear from that inside, from the outside voice again, Sam. What's going on in your head? Um, when you negotiate, do you negotiate by the square foot, like the price for the square foot or just the overall price of the, the building? Okay, great. So there is listing a property to put on the market and determining what 
rate you will offer the property for. So in this case, the owner of the property was at 2,500 square feet. And the owner came to us and said, hey, I have 2,500 square feet that I want to offer to the world. I want someone to lease it from me. And we said, great, how much will you charge? And the owner, with the help of another real estate professional, determined that maybe he wanted $35 a square foot for his property. Maybe he wanted 40. Landlords want what they want. Now, representing Walgreen, the tenant, I brought them to the space, and now I negotiated with the landlord's representative, and we then, using market information, determined that, hey, you know what? This space isn't worth $40 to my tenant, but my tenant would be willing to pay $33. And that's a long negotiation that has a lot of factors that go into it. But, but the key determinant in negotiating a successful transaction, Sam, is market knowledge. You knowing what other spaces like this space lease for in the area. You have to know that, oh, well, you know, right up the street, somebody else just leased space for $30 a square foot. Or right around the corner, there was some other space that leased for $27 a square foot. So, Mr. Landlord, I know you want $40, but the market in your area is determining that it's not worth what you want. And that's that negotiation comes as a function of your knowledge of your local market area. That's where you have to spend your time, Sam, developing your expertise in that local market, that local market knowledge that you pick up by visiting properties all the time in that area. And that's how you use that information to support your client on whatever side of the table you're on, whether you're representing the landlord or the tenant, market knowledge and good negotiating skills helps you. Great question. Thank you. Here's another one. Hey, speak of the devil. We were just talking about representing the landlord. In this case, we were representing the landlord for another $2,500. You've been in the 7-Elevens before, haven't you? Yeah, of course. Again, Sam, what I want you to begin to see here is start seeing these businesses that you go to every day, Walgreens, 7-Eleven. Oh, they are leasing space here. In this case, 2,500 square feet of space for 10 years. That's what those retail businesses want they want long-term leases right the, the the walgreens down there in charlottesville has been there since forever because they get long-term leases because they know students are coming and going every year and they want to be right here they want you to know right where you can find them the 7-elevens is going to be right here on this corner waiting for you to come and get your big slurp your big gulp right and we negotiate, again, in this case, $44 a square foot. So you begin to see different types of services you can offer. Same with multifamily properties. I understand you're interested in investing in properties, right? Yes, sir. Now, when you say you want to invest in properties, what does that mean? Um, mostly, I want to own a gym when I get older, so stuff like that, um, beach houses, apartments, everything like that. Okay, great. Well, the gym that you want to own is probably going to be in a warehouse type facility. Now, when you own that building, are you then intending to operate a service inside the building? 
like a gold gym where people come and pay a membership fee to come into your space? Yes, sir. See, you can do that as a real estate profession. Mm -hmm. Or oh, those beach houses that you want to buy. You're not going to sleep in all of them. So you want to, I guess, lease them out, rent them out, mm -hmm. maybe through Airbnb of some sort to people who want to come to the beach when you're not there. Hopefully I have enough money one day. I could I can sleep in all of them. Different one every well, night. You can never sleep in all of them at the same time, Sam. No. Monday, no. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay, great. Well, there you go. So multifamily properties also allow you what we call income generating properties. People always need somewhere to rent to live, Sam. And so you as an investor owner could purchase a 12 unit apartment building and even though all the units are one bedrooms if it's a nice 12 unit building near the campus of the university of virginia then there may be upper uh, uh, uh students junior seniors graduate students uh faculty who want to live close to the campus are willing to pay you rent to live in your one bedroom, one bath unit. And again, you you might could pick up one of those 12 units down there in Charlottesville, probably not for 700,000. Could be if it's close to, it could be, I don't know. But that would be something worth investigating to generate income for you, renting out all 12 of those units. And then there's land, you know, we're not making any more land here. We're not. But the land that is not developed can be sold to developers who then could build on it 30 new townhomes to then be sold to 30 new families that want to live in these brand new townhomes. And you as a real estate professional could help a builder identify some land, help him acquire that land, and then help him sell those 30 townhomes when he's done building them. All right. Let's pick up the speed here, Sam. So, focusing, right? Uh, Sam. One of the things you want to do right now as you're going forth exploring a career in real estate is to get focused on one primary area that you will invest your time in and focus on and become an expert in. Focusing isn't limiting. It doesn't have to limit the opportunities for you, Sam. But let's think about it in terms of football. What position do you play? Defensive line. Defensive line. You don't play on the whole line, Sam. What position do you play um, on the line? Uh, D tackle. You play D tackle. Now, there are on defense 11 players playing, as I remember how the game was played, right? I mean, it's been yes, a long time since I was playing, but it's still 11 players, right? Yes, sir. And you're D tackle, and you're one of 11 players on the field. That means there are 10 other players who have 10 other positions and roles and responsibilities, and they all do what they do very well if they are starters, right? Yep. Or even second team. Yeah. Right? They are, the starters would be considered experts in that position. They number one, right? Now, very few, if any, at the D1 level, at the University of Virginia, I don't know. It might not be the case, but I would speculate that very few, if any, individuals who are starters in a particular position on the team also play in a second or third position on the team. 
D tackles probably are not also playing quarterback on offense. Nope. D tackle on defense probably is also not the punter. Right? Yeah. The running back on the offense is also probably not the safety on the defense. Right? Yes, sir. The same applies here with your career. That same mentality, Sam, that you want to focus on one area for your business to become an expert in that one area, that one position, so that everyone knows to come to you for that one thing. That doesn't mean you can't get involved in other areas that we've talked about where your business where you can generate business. But I want you now to begin to think about the one area that you're going to focus on and begin your process of learning everything about becoming an expert in that one area. You follow me, Sam? Yeah. Pick one. Start with one. Don't chase your tail and be all over the place. Don't try to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. Be a master of one area that you want to focus all your energy, that you wake up every day thinking about this area. Doesn't mean that in the afternoon you don't do something else, right? Because even though you're on the defensive line, right? Yes, sir. You might also be on the kickoff return team. Is that a possibility? Yes, sir. So you might have to learn how to be on kickoff on punt returns, right? Yes, sir. Exactly. So even though your primary area of expertise is defensive tackle, some sub areas might be punt return team and that's how you want to approach a career in real estate so here's an example of someone who's focusing primarily on retail services and then we get to see the different areas that someone who is wanting to be a retail real estate professional but we can see the different opportunities they can still generate focusing just on retail. So in this example, with a retail focus, that agent could represent investors helping them buy retail properties for sale. So they can make a sale buying retail space. Or you could help an investor purchase. You could help them sell some retail space. You can purchase some retail space. You could help a landlord lease some space to a 7-Eleven. Or you could help a tenant lease some space, like a Walgreens. Or you could help a developer buy some land that they then build a retail bay on. Have you seen those new four bays down in Charlottesville where it's got the T-Mobile, the Chipotle, and a couple other things all together? And they're sitting out in the middle of the parking lot. Someone, a real estate professional, negotiated and acquired that small patch of land on the parking lot so that a developer could build the four bays, retail bays, and then lease them out to the Chipotle, T-Mobile, and something else that have found that we do well together, that people like to come get their Chipotle and pick up a new T-Mobile cell phone. Right? So that's how you become an expert, Sam, by focusing on one area. And that's what you want to do. So, again, focusing on one area doesn't limit you, Sam. Right? So hit me with your outside voice, Sam. What what, what are you thinking? Sounds like a good idea to uh, buy property lease it out like you said have the develop uh or how the real estate agent gets the piece of land for a developer 
and uh, builds those four different bays. I think about that. Sounds like a really smart idea, though. There you go. All being done by the real estate professional. Sir. Okay. Now, consulting. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about consulting. There's a lot of discussions that take place about I'm a consultant, you're a consultant. If you are working as an independent contractor, as a real estate professional, you do have the opportunity to take your knowledge and expertise and help other people achieve their real estate goals and objectives as a consultant. It, it, the best way to do it is to have a separate consulting agreement to share with your clients so that they know the difference between when you are being a real estate agent and being a consultant. There are a lot of differences here between the two. Uh, primarily, here's what you want to remember, Sam, about being a real estate professional. Typically, generally, in most instances, we work on a 100% commission basis, which means that we provide our services up front and we earn our fee at the end of the transaction once it's been successful. That means from the start to the end, we are working, monitoring, negotiating, but we don't earn fees till the end. And if the transaction blows up, we don't earn anything. That's the nature of a commissioned business. That's the nature of running a business, right? I mean, the people at McDonald's, they run a business. When do they earn money? When you order the Happy Meal. If nobody orders Happy Meals today, they don't make any money today. So like any business, the income is earned when the services have been rendered and completed. Consulting is different. Consulting is where you are paid to think. And the beauty of consulting is, is that people have to pay you up front before you start thinking. And they pay you retainers to think and plan. And you can earn fees up front. That's your general difference here with consulting that you want to keep in mind. Um, we're we're going to jump here to the third area, which is an area I know that's you know near and dear for you. And that is more school. <laughs> right? More education. You know, this is what's ahead for you as a real estate professional. Uh, there is a variety of education out here, Sam, for you to learn about. Uh, my company, Keller Williams, offers a lot of education. Uh, the CCIM Institute, CCIM.com, uh, uh, offers a lot of education. There's a lot of uh, education. There's mentoring, right? You're getting a, a lot of education here today on a, on a coaching call. Right. Uh, so there's a lot of education associated with a career in real estate. Um, and finally, follow up and follow through. If you're going to become a real estate professional and you're going to provide services to clients. Uh, the the number one. Area in which real estate professionals fail in their business is to follow up and follow through with both leads and with clients. That the, the number one, you know, they did this study and they talked to current owner, buy, uh, owners who are selling their properties, who've sold properties, and now they've listed the property. They said, hey, uh, you know, why, why did you pick this real estate agent? Uh, to work with you. Uh, and it's and the number one answer is, is that they followed up with me. They were persistent. They they continually followed up with me about the business. I said, well, what about the agent who helped you buy the house? They said, well, after he sold me the house, we never heard from him anymore. 
and and that's that's the number one challenge is to continually follow up with leads and prospects to inform them that you offer a service that they can utilize and to follow up with past clients continually to remind them that you are here and available to provide that service. That's the nature of being a, a real estate professional. Hey, we're at the summary. We've gone over the pros and cons of a career in real estate. Uh, oh, we're at the end. I want to thank you for attending. And when you or someone you know is ready to get into real estate as an agent, an owner, a seller, a buyer, investor, or tenant, call the Anthony Bowling Group on 240-339-6979. Our leveraged relationships will save you time and make you money. See, that was my shameless plug for the rest of the people out there who might be looking for a excited, competent, energetic real estate professional to work with. You, you always have to be marketing. Now, I do have some plus. We offer some unique training, bold, but here's what I want to share with you. I only recommend uh, a number of books for persons thinking about getting into the real estate industry. The first two are the Millionaire Real Estate Agent by Gary Keller, named after the company Keller Williams, Gary Keller. This has become sort of a staple in the industry. Uh, it is a book that will uh, show you exactly how to build a real estate company uh, from beginning to end. Uh, it is the Bible it, it, for getting into real estate it's just a must read uh, and, and you don't read it just once. Uh, you continue over and over and over again with it. Now, the E-Myth for Real Estate Agents by Michael Gerber and Brad Korn. Korn is a, a Keller Williams agent. This book, I find, uh, is the rocket fuel to the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book written by Gary Keller. This book here, which the title is very appropriate, Why Most Real Estate Businesses Don't Work and What to Do About It. And that's the challenge. A lot of times, Sam, like playing football, right? You don't make the tackle, you don't make the play. But it's now when you go back to in the huddle, right? In game time, it's not time for practice. But it's like, what do I do about it? What am I going to do about this guy that's still blocking me? How do I get by this guy? And 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 someone, a coach, pulls you in on the sideline and says, try this technique. Try that technique. Go this way. Do this. Give you some additional tool to help you get by this guy. That's what the e myth for real estate agent book does. It tells you how to really make it go and get going and, and successfully. Now, these last two books are a must as well. I appreciate Sam you taking the time uh, to reach out to me through our UVA mentoring network, shameless plug for the UVA mentoring network. And thanks to my teammate, Dean Hackermer, uh, uh, who uh, invited us to, to get together on this call. Um, there are certain skills that are required to have a successful career in real estate. Um, different people are going to have different opinions about it. There's going to be plenty of people out here telling you, you can do this or you can do that. You don't have to do this. Here, buy this, buy this golden pill and all the money is just going to just rain from the sky on you, Sam. I've been doing this, like I said, since my junior year at UVA. I've been licensed and working at it 
continually. I've done a different things, law school, diff, different things, but but I've stayed right here. This is what I'm doing. Um, getting on the telephone and calling people is the number one skill required to be successful as a real estate professional, period. See, the pause there was for dramatic effect, Sam. <laughs> it's, it's about being on the phone. You got to be able to call people. If you talk to anyone in real estate and they suggest to you that they don't get on the phone, they don't make no phone calls, uh, probably they're not making no, they're not making no money. They're not successful. Somehow, people have to know that you and your business offer real estate services that they can avail themselves to. You got to call people to move them, and these two books here prepare you for a life in real estate or in sales, you, you got to be on the phone prospecting. Jed Blunt's book, Fanatical Prospecting, I find to be a excellent book about getting on the phone, calling, dealing with objections, dealing with people hanging up on you, dealing with people telling you no, dealing with people telling you, I'm going to tell your mama you called me. Okay, dude, you got to get on the phone. Now, there are a lot of different ways to be on the phone and all. And I find the other book by Sidney Walker, How I Conquered My Call Reluctance and Fear of Self-Promotion and Increase My Prospecting. I find this to be an excellent book. It comes at the same topic, but with a different tempo, a different perspective. These are two sides of the same coin. The coin is... You got to be on the phone prospecting and calling people. Now, you can do it the Jed Blunt way. You can do it the Sydney Walker way. The bottom line is you got to be on the phone calling. And if you are saying, yeah, that phone calling people, talking to them. And even in today's, now after the pandemic, like what we're doing today here on this Zoom call, this live call and all. Being on social media, being on a, on, on a live call, I'm talking to my clients now daily, just like this, Zoom call presentation from the comfort of their home where I can meet with them wherever they are and talk to them about their needs, their, their requirements, and how I'm going to go about satisfying those requirements. That's the business I'm in. That's that's what I'm doing. But I, it, you can't be a secret squirrel. You can't have it under a bush hiding and no one knows that that's what you do. And every now and then someone says, hey, Sam, aren't you a real estate agent? Yeah, no, that, that's not going to get it, Sam. That's not going to get you there. So these are the four books. Uh, all four of them are on audio. So you can go audio book. Uh, Although, you know, you're a junior in college at UVA, I mean, you could read through these books several times, probably in a day, maybe not in a day. But the point is, work them into your schedule, Sam, these, these four books. Hey, my friend, we are at the end. In fact, we are eight minutes over. I, you know, I know I've droned on here, but... Uh, I appreciate you you giving me a call and reaching out. I, I tell me, Sam, you have it. You you started out an hour and nine minutes ago with an interest in real estate. It's an hour and nine minutes later. Talk to me, brother. Tell me what you feel. Tell me, tell me what you think about now. Tell me where you're going. Tell the people out there you know, what you got from it. I'm definitely a lot more interested now after talking. And I'm, I think I'm a lot more interested in the commercial real estate side as before I was considering residential as well. But I, I think I'm really interested in 
like the commercial real estate side and warehouses, stuff like that, like big buildings. Okay. All right. Great. Well, again, you can, there is no limitation on you getting involved in commercial real estate right now. You know, right now, for example, Sam, you could join a CCIM local chapter. You don't have to be a CCIM designee to join a chapter. That's part of the affiliation. You want to get involved in commercial real estate? Sam, you need to join the CCIM chapter down there in, in Charlottesville in Virginia. or Because I know there's one down in, in the Hampton Roads area. Uh, it, you can go online. You need to start affiliating with people who are involved in commercial real estate. You need to get those four books. I've recommended to you, go through them several times and begin this journey towards your career as a commercial real estate professional. There are a lot of companies out there who will be excited to have you when you graduate uh, from school to join them. I certainly would be one. Thank uh, you. Yes, but but there will certainly be plenty of other suitors for you. The point is, is that over this next two years, you 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 continue to get information. We continue to talk. Uh, I continue to mentor. You continue to mentee. Uh, you will be ready to select the appropriate company for you to join that's going to meet your business objectives when you leave school. And you'll be in a position to make the decision that works best for you. And you'll have options uh, to consider uh, because between now and then you will gather relevant information that's going to empower you to, to have you be uh, exceptionally competitive in pursuit of your commercial real estate career. I'm excited for you. I'm always happy when people want to come into an industry that I've devoted more than 35 years to, Sam. I, I love it. I think it's it's the absolute best. And uh, so I'm excited that you want to get involved. Um, and I'm here uh, as a, as a, oh, okay. You can see it in the background. There it is right there. That's what you're working for. Yes, sir. That's what you're working for right there. Is that what you want? Yes, sir. That what, that's what you want right there. Yeah, the one right here. <laughs> that's what we want. Yes. And uh, yeah, man. So I'm happy for you. Congratulations, brother. Thank you very much. You, you got all my information. That's the thing about mentoring, though, uh, Sam. It's two-way for me. It's two-way, right? When I'm doing my coaching and all, I'm working with people. On these coaching calls, I always tell them, hey, uh, this is not parenting. I got two children. My son, in fact, my son is down at University of Memphis, just walked on to the football team down at University of Memphis. Congratulations. Uh, and he plays the greatest chapter fraternity there is, Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. You, you, are you a member of fraternity? No, sir. You might want to consider Kappa. Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. they they down at UVA. We got a chapter there. You might want to consider capital. But the point is uh, that, um, what was the point? Sometimes I talk so much, I forget my point. Uh, anyway, I'm happy for you. If that point comes back to me, then, then we'll catch it. So, uh, no, no, it was on mentoring two ways. And, and the two ways is, it's not parenting, where I open your mouth, I put food down your throat, and I help you chew it and pat your tummy and burp you. Okay, that's parenting. No, mentoring is you pushing at me, dude. You coming at me. You coming at me hard because you want to know something. You're trying to learn something. You need something. That That's how you do it. Just like you do with your line coach. You coming at him. Dude is not chasing you down, trying to find a, Hey, Sam, how's practice going today? Oh, did you get your plate? No, that's not how it's done. You want something, you go after it, and you push 
the resource to give you what you need to be successful. If you're sitting around waiting for it to come to you, then you're going to be riding the pine. Right? Yes, sir. There you go. So don't ride the pine. But I'm here for you and ready to be of service. Hey, Sam. In closing, I'll let you close this out. Well, not really close this out because I'm always going to get the last word. But go ahead. What you got to say, Sam? Talk uh, to the people. Tell them. Just thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you trying to help me out. I think you have a lot today. And I just appreciate it. You're very welcome, Sam. It's been my pleasure. Again, everybody, this is Sam Bond, a junior, a rising junior at the University of Virginia, who's saying, hey, he wants to get his career in real estate started. Reached out through our UVA network to be connected with an experienced real estate professional to tell him what it's like. I'm Anthony Bowling with the Anthony Bowling Group. And this has been another episode of Chasing Gazillions. Ain't the same as making millions. So you want to be a real estate professional. Hey, we've enjoyed our time with you all. You all have my number. Uh, hopefully my number and stuff popped up somewhere. But hey, get in touch with me uh, for coaching, real estate services, or if you just want to talk because I like talking. You all take care. All the best. Have a great day, Sam. Take care. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. All the best. Bye. Bye.